to this online service for the 26th of July. My name is Alison Cook and I am the Curate at Christ Church Stannington. Welcome to everybody who is part of our normal congregation and welcome to those of you who have started watching us from further afield. You may notice that I'm not actually in Stannington at the moment, I'm round at my mum's house. Uh, behind me there is quite a large bush. I remember my dad planting that bush when I was only little. It's now grown to a huge bush and uh, I've got many fond memories of sitting in the sitting room with my mum, watching the birds come and land in its branches and then dart out onto the bird feeders. So I'm hoping that as we, this service progresses that maybe one or two birds will have the courage to pop out and be part of our worship today as we find out a little bit more about Jesus's parable of the mustard seed and how that too grew into an enormous tree that the birds of the air were able to find rest in. If you want to follow this service using words you'll find them on our website www.christchurchstunnington.co.uk and you'll also find part way through the service a link to the children's activities so you'd be able to click onto that if you want to follow what Peggy's got to share with you this morning. And thank you very much to Christchurch's various music groups for the music that will uh, be accompanying this service. So let's quieten our souls and begin our time of worship together. The Lord be with you. So let's sing. We've got two songs, Over all the earth you reign on high, and then everyone needs compassion. Jesus conquered the grave. 
So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever offer our salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing. For the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. So now, resting in that knowledge of God's love and compassion for us. Let's receive God's forgiveness. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. So we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen in us all our goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say the collect together. Generous God, you give us gifts and make them grow. Though our faith is as small as a mustard seed, make it grow to your glory and the flourishing of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now it's time for our Bible readings, which will be brought to us by Carol and then by Jim. And after that, Jim will lead us in our uh, talk. Taken from the Book of Romans, chapter 8, reading from verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God, who sees into our hearts, knows what the thought of the Spirit is, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, with those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those whom God had already chosen he also set apart to become like his Son, so that the Son would be the first among many brothers. And so those whom God set apart he called, and those who he called he put right with himself, 
and he shared his glory with them. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son, will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right-hand side of God, pleading with him for us. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? As the scripture says, for your sake, we are in danger of death at all times. We are treated like sheep that are going to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am certain that neither nothing can separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor other <clears throat> heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading is taken from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St Matthew, chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. Glory to you, O Lord. The Parable of the Mustard Seed Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man takes a mustard seed and sows it in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows up, it is the biggest of all plants. It becomes a tree, so that birds can come and make their nests in its branches. The Parable of the Yeast Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A woman takes some yeast and mixes it with a bushel of flour until the whole batch of dough rises. And now from verse 44, the parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field. He covers it up again and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and then goes back and buys that field. The parable of the pearl. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man is looking for fine pearls, and when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. The parable of the net. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Some fishermen throw their net out into the lake to catch all kinds of fish. When the net is full, they pull it to shore and sit, sit down to divide the fish. The good ones go into the buckets, the worthless ones are thrown away. It will be like this at the end of the age. The angels will go out and gather up the evil people from among the good and will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will cry and gnash their teeth. New truths for old. Do you understand these things? Jesus asked them. Yes, they replied. So, he replied, this means that every teacher of the law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who takes new and old things out of his storage room. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heavenly Father, in the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you open the hearts and minds of everyone hearing these words. Feed into each one the message you wish them personally to receive, so they can know your will for them, and give them the courage to act on that. In the name of your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Hello, my name is Jim Glynn. I'm a reader at Christchurch Stannington. 
In our Gospel reading, Jesus likened the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, which is the very smallest of seeds and yet can grow into a plant, even a tree, 10 to 12 feet high with large branches. Birds of the air find comfort in its shade. If you were to look hard into it, into your experiences, you'd probably never run out of mustard seed examples of how something very small grew unimaginably large. Here's just one. A young teenager was walking to church in a blinding snowstorm. He was unable to get to his church, so he went into a little chapel which was on his way. The storm was so severe that the preacher couldn't make it in that night. So a layman stood up to throw something together for the tiny group gathered there. He spoke on just one verse, Isaiah 45, 22, which tells of the Lord saying to his people, Turn to me now and be saved, people all over the world. I am the only God there is. And from that one small mustard seed, in most unlikely circumstances, faith was planted into the heart of that teen boy for the first time. His name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the man I spoke of a few weeks ago. If you remember, his preaching was so powerful that it affected people all over the world. He was known as the Prince of Pe Preachers, who won thousands to Christ and built a 5,000 seat auditorium in his 20s, which was never big enough to accommodate the crowds. Yes, a whole lot can come from just a little mustard seed. It was a miracle. Do you believe in miracles? They're happening all the time. We're just not tuned into them. A book I was once reading had the following in it. A man called Chatam from an Indian reservation was visiting a friend in New York. As they were walking along the busy street, Chatam said to his friend, Sam, did you hear that cricket? The street was very noisy and the traffic made it even worse. I can't believe you can hear a cricket with all this noise going on, said Sam. Chatam smiled, took a quarter from his pocket and spun it into the air. When it hit the ground, everyone within a ten-yard radius turned to see what had happened. They were tuned into the sound of the coin, but not of the cricket. We don't see the miracles happening around us because we're not tuned in to seeing them. One of the most common ones, if a miracle can ever be common, is when a person accepts Christ for the first time. It's only common because it happens to a lot of people. Do you remember when it happened to you? I do. Some of you may remember my testimony of coming to Christ. Some won't. I always think it's a good thing to look back from time to time at how we started and the growth in our faith due to help from the Holy Spirit and from others he put into our lives. I arrived at that point following an amazing number of coincidences, leaving to my wife, Jean, and I meeting the couple we first talked to about Jesus. When God's at work, I believe there's no such thing as a coincidence. Our conversations with them were always lively, and we enjoyed our evenings together immensely. Then our times with them changed. They were no less enjoyable, but they were different, more relaxed, calmer in some way. The transformation was so marked that we eventually passed comment on it and asked them what had happened in their lives. Unusually for them, they became quite reticent and didn't seem to know what to say. Eventually they told us they had become Christians. The room went very quiet. Because we four had always had been open with each other, Jean broke the silence by telling them 
she was an atheist. I told them I was an agnostic, though not with my usual bullishness on the subject, with each of us giving reasons for our stance. On our way home that night, I remember saying to Jean something like, you know, if this faith of theirs can do this for them, perhaps we ought to look into it. One wonderful example of just how behaving like a Christian can bring people to Christ. From that moment, things changed for us. Everywhere we looked, we saw things about Jesus. We found out friends we had were Christians. There was a quarter page advert in our national newspaper, like the pointing finger of Kitchener during the war, which used to say, your country needs you. This one was just like it, but said, Jesus wants you. There isn't time to tell you of more such occurrences, but the pressure became overwhelming. The next time we saw our newly converted friends, we mentioned that we'd like to hear more about Christianity. They were over the moon and said they'd get someone from their church to come and see us, which they did. He was a nice chap. We asked all the usual questions like, if there's a God, why does he allow suffering in the world? Why do good people die young and bad ones live to old age, etc, etc. He answered them all well, but it just didn't work for us. I expressed an interest in Christianity to our consultant at work, and he said Jean and I must speak to his wife and invited us to his house. We asked all the same questions. I could swear she gave just about the same answers that we'd heard before. But suddenly, it all made sense. I suppose she could have said like Ananias in Acts 9.17, when he said to Saul, Jesus has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jean and I talked it over when we got home. Later, each of us made our commitment in different rooms without the knowledge of the other. We said the simple prayer we'd been told about, which had words similar to, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Saviour. In your name. Amen. I suppose we expected thunder and lightning, but seemingly nothing happened. All we felt was a lifting of the pressure of indecision. A very experienced Christian couple who were friends of the lady we talked to got in touch and they became our spiritual mentors for many years. Sadly for us, not for her, the Lord has now taken one of them. For my final link with this scripture, I can tell you that like most Christians, I couldn't wait to tell everyone what I'd learned about Jesus. Now many people knew of my previous antipathy to the Christian faith. So you might say, as they did about Paul, in Acts 9.21, all who heard him were amazed. That's an explanation of how things happen from an earthly point of view. How do you think it might have been seen looking down from heaven? Well, with a bit of conjecture and some scripture, here's how I think things went. The Lord, who knows all things, knew about me before I was born. Scripture tells us that he'd said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. As he did that, he made a plan for my life. I was born to loving parents who both possessed quite a stubborn streak. God knew I would need a double dose of this trait, which has enabled me to resist attacks on my personal faith from all quarters. For what he had in mind for me, 
the Lord wanted me to have other characteristics as well. I was given a Christian name that would cause me problems all my life. Even now, when I give my name to someone at a desk, many look up and say, Do you mean James? This has always made me want to scream, No, I don't mean James. But I usually manage to say politely, No, it's Jim. This has also given me the rudiments of being tolerant of others. So what else did God know I'd need? Well, there was another series of coincidences that should never have occurred and they put me, quite unexpectedly, in the army. There I learned the meaning and the value of discipline, especially self-discipline. Both in my army and civilian careers, I was put in charge of various units, which taught me the responsibilities as well as the perks of leadership. I've always found there are far more responsibilities than perks. So if I believe that the Lord had in mind that I should be doing just what I'm doing now, what other skills might I need? Because of the course my life took, I was given experience of communicating with the public in general and in teaching small groups of students. Yet another almost unbelievable set of coincidences put me in my final paid employment at the Trent Regional Health Authority, a job which I never dreamed I would have. I'd been messing about with computers since 90, 1981, but there I learned how to use a computer to collect facts, to organise them into some sort of intelligible sequence. I also had to give presentations to groups of people substantially larger than of our 1030 services. As something thrown in for good measure, God perhaps thought that a couple of extremely life-threatening experiences would give me a better idea of just how much life means to most people. It's probably the most important thing of all. My next period of training was on the Reader's Course. It was during those three years that all of my life's experiences were pulled together into one package. Last year, I reached my 80th birthday, at which time some readers retire, hang up their scarves and hand in their licences. I feel that the Lord still has work for me to do, so I'm hoping to receive some direction about that in the near future. My wife has reminded me that by the time you see this, I shall be 81. Doesn't it just tick away? Once again, what took place as my life began to head towards faith in Jesus, I have only described from an earthly viewpoint, using scripture and conjecture, here's what could have happened in heaven. God decided that I'd had enough preparation and it was time to reel me in. He put the right people in place, both to lead Jean and me to the Lord and to nurture us afterwards. And what would have happened in heaven when we finally accepted the truth? I said earlier that when I committed to Jesus, nothing happened. That was nothing apparent. Actually, there would have been fanfares, the singing of angels and great celebration. Jesus said, I tell you that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons, persons who do not need to repent. And all of that happened as each one of us here accepted Jesus as our Lord and Master. So that's my story as I see it. God gave me other gifts and preparations that time restriction mean I can tell you only the minimum that will put over the idea of how God equips us. Is my story unique? Well, yes, it is, but only in as much as it is my story. Each one of you will have your own story, some perhaps similar, some very different, about how you came to know the Lord. In fact, every believer in the world will have one. There will have been preparations in your life 
for you to make an informed decision and gifts to help you on your Christian journey. If your memory is good enough or the steps plain enough, it will be possible for you to realise just how clever your God was in de designing a plan just for you, tailored to your needs down to the last detail that dovetailed into the plans he'd given everyone else. That plan will ensure that you not only believe, but will have been trained in a way known only to you. Trained to serve the Lord in the capacity he planned for you. Wouldn't it be a shame if all that planning and effort were not put into practice? One thing I'm sure of is that our God has spent time and energy preparing us for something. It won't be anything that we can't do. And it won't be without its pleasures. And it won't be without its rewards. God didn't give us our gifts to show others how clever or talented we are. Or even to privately enjoy them but to do his work. Of course, we shouldn't be doing God's work for reward, but the Bible tells us quite a few times that we shall indeed earn reward for what we do. For example, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Jesus said, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. Then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The next time you get a chance to relax, perhaps even this afternoon, it might be good for you to examine your own lifetime of preparation. Realise your God-given gifts and put them to work for him. Who can even begin to imagine the kind of rewards our Father in heaven has for us? But when all is said and done, there has to be that mustard seed moment. Think back and try hard to remember what yours was. And never forget, the plant must be nurtured. What was our moment? when two middle-aged people had the courage to speak up about their faith in Jesus, even though it might have lost them two good friends. If any of us ever get that chance, we should surely take it. Amen. Heavenly Father, please bring to our minds the time our own personal mustard seed was planted. Show us as we remember the different signposts and opening and closing of doors which led us to the place we are now in with our relationship with you. Also, Lord, furnish us with the opportunities to plant mustard seeds into the lives of others and give us the courage to speak out when we don't know how our words will be received. In the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's sing again. We're going to sing a new song led by Shelley and Simon. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in Gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love, and the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. As far Try
also of our faith, what we believe, by saying the creed together. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is, is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Today is our healing service. So you might like to pause and just think for a moment of someone you know who might be in need of healing. Or you might need to bring to God some of your own needs. So just in a moment's quiet, ready yourself and bring those needs to your mind and present them to God. Bringing to God our need for healing and the need of others. May Christ bring us wholeness of body, mind and spirit. Deliver us from every evil and give us his peace. Amen. Our prayers today have been prepared for us by Margaret. I'm going to read them and the words should appear on the screen as well. So let us pray to God the Father through the Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses and pleads with God on behalf of his people 
in accordance with his will. Lord, we pray for your church throughout the world, remembering those Christians who suffer for their faith in many areas of the world, facing persecution and discrimination. Lord, strengthen and encourage them in their faith. Keep safe all who have been called by you to preach the gospel in, different, uh, in a different country and help them to demonstrate your love in the nations of the world, especially countries already suffering from natural disasters and now having to cope with coronavirus, with poor health care facilities and overcrowded refugee camps. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of the church in our own country, for our Archbishop Justin Welby, and for the new Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, for our diocesan Bishop Pete, and Sophie, the Bishop of Doncaster, and the challenges they face, that you will give them wisdom, strength and encouragement, so that by word and deed, they may proclaim your saving love. We pray for our parish priest, Tim, and our curate Alison here in Stannington, at this difficult time when we are not able to meet in church for Sunday services. For all who help to produce online services, our website and online magazines, as we aim to reach those in our community who are able to access them. And for our network groups, helping us to keep in touch with one another. We pray for those helping with the Stannington Food Bank, now Joe, our curate for the last two years, is working in his new parish. And we ask your blessing on him and his family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As lockdown restrictions ease, we remember those who still need shielding, those nervous about going out after weeks of isolation, and those still suffering the effect of COVID-19, or who have lost loved ones, and all who are anxious. Lord, give them your comfort and peace. With outbreaks of the infection occurring in different parts of the country, we pray for good sense and social distancing to stop the spread of the disease and for a more reliable track and trace system. We pray for those countries where the disease is still spreading rapidly and the vaccines being tested will prove effective in treating coronavirus. And we give thanks for the dedicated scientists working on the research and trials. We pray for our NHS that hospitals will be able to offer more treatment to those whose operations and tests have been postponed for several months and give thanks for all who are working so hard with skill and sympathy to restore people to health. Lord, be close to those suffering in any way at this time especially those known to us, whom we bring to you in a moment of quiet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our government, the cabinet and MPs, for wisdom to make the right decisions and give clear leadership that the economy will begin to recover and trade negotiations with the EU will proceed. We give thanks for our Queen and her encouragement to the nation. Grant her good health and knowledge of your will. As people become more confident about returning to work, we remember those who have lost their jobs and are worried about their future and loss of income. For businesses struggling to survive, and keep their staff employed, and those who need to rely on food banks for enough to eat, for children who have missed so much education at school, and teachers who have been providing online teaching. We pray for patience for parents in high-rise flats or with no access to a garden, as children are on holiday at home for another month, and for those suffering domestic abuse that they will be able to seek help. 
charities are experiencing a huge drop in income as most fundraising events are cancelled. And Sheffield's Children's Hospital is particularly affected with its building programme having to be postponed. We pray for generous donors and the support of the people of Sheffield. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you call your followers to seek first your kingdom. It is easy to be absorbed in our own worries and miss the hidden treasure of knowing Christ. In our diocesan prayer, we ask that you renew us as we seek to make your love known. Release us to share freely in mission and rejuvenate us to be fruitful in your service. Give us wisdom, Lord, to know where our true treasure lies and there to set our hearts that we may see the signs of your kingdom in the world and play our part in nurturing them until the whole world acknowledges you as creator and king. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And we bring our prayers to a close by joining together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we join together with our final hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.